What up, y'all? I'm Steve with Elevate, and today we got a really cool Elevate today with Bubbles the Butcher. Holy mackerels. Uh, the guy's art is phenomenal. Uh, he's just next level, and I've been following this guy for so long, and uh, I, I'm excited. I want to throw it out there. We need your help. We need your help getting uh, our name out there, getting Elevate out there, and the most coolest way is with our brand ambassador program called Elevate Dolls. It's really cool, check it out. Anyways, let's roll in to this really cool thing. Well, we got Bubbles the Butcher here, and thanks a lot for joining us. How are you today? I'm not too bad. I mean, I've been kind of hangover a bit, but my brothers came in town. And, yeah, uh, that, it was just that, a lot of drinking. <laughs> when was the last time you got to see your brothers and whatnot? Uh, before COVID hit, I guess, so it's been a little over a year. So that's good, man. Good family bonding. That's always needed. Yeah. Um, how did you get start blowing? How did you get started blowing glass? Um, let's see. My brother called me one day while I was working in Cook City, which is at the edge of Yellowstone National Park. And um, he just said he was starting it. And I hitchhiked down to Texas and started learning with him a bit through Matt. Man, what was his last name? He was in Denton. I think it was Marshawn. And uh, they basically let me do some cold working while I was there, while my brother was learning like spoons and Sherlock's and stuff. And uh, that, that was basically the start of it. Then we moved into my mom's garage and started, you know, our own mini studio. Yeah, yeah. And when was that? Oh, uh, I want to say it was like 11 years ago. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, don't, don't quote me on that, but I think it was about 11 years ago. Yeah, time flies and it just becomes this like, little bunched up thing sometimes <laughs> yeah well, i think at the beginning you know i i kept track of it a lot like oh i'm a two-year blower i'm a four-year blower or whatever <laughs> i think as time goes on it's just like i just blow glass you know it's just like <clears throat> just kind of comes a part of you and you don't really need to calculate it or track it anymore yeah i like that that's good man um what, what items did you start out with you said you were doing cold um cold work and when you went into your own studio what did you start with, like pipes or pendants or? Uh, so I personally did solid for a full year. Um, we moved into my mom's garage. Basically, like half of it was storage. So we bought a Paragon Caldera, if you know which one that is. It's, like it's the this... round ones, right? No, it's the uh, tiny cube ones with a flip door that maybe has like a. Oh, about this tall. Uh, yeah, here, maybe I should turn you. There we go. Now I can see you better. All right, that's much more feasible. Um, yeah, it's they're about a real that small big. door and like long, yeah, right? There's like that much of an opening at best. And so uh, we got that. We set up a box fan in the back door, and then uh, we bought a Red Max, <laughs> and we basically worked off of one K tank and a propane tank off of like a picnic table, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, wait. What was the question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, what things start... did you start making? Yeah. Oh, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, so we only had that. Basically, with small pipes is all that could fit. Yeah. Um, I did solid for a full year because I wanted to master glass and, like, all the artistic stuff rather than doing, like, production pipes. What kind uh, of solid stuff were you doing? Uh, mushroom pushes. Yeah. Space scenes, vortexes, uh, sculpting. Like the first form I sculpted is, I think, with seemingly most people in glass now is like the female body. And then I had to put like wings on it and called it angels and probably did like 30 of those. And uh, everything I did was basically, besides those, was to put on my brother's pieces uh, so he could sell that to shops. So I'd make him a bunch of marbles. He'd make a clear spoon. We'd shove the marble on and sell it for, you know, four bucks. Right, right. Yeah, you were the, you were the artistic guy. The yeah, I mean, he, he was too. I was more so just like, I would say that my brother was, I was more so like his apprentice situation, even though he was only like three months ahead of me. Okay. 
So it was kind of that, like, we were teaching each other, but he was like, well, I'm going to lead, like, you know, the production of things. And we'd go to all the Dallas shops within the first, like, few months. And we were just selling, like, a bunch of one-hitters with, like, dots you could knock off, you know, and spoons. that they'd be like, there's a small check here. And we'd be like, we'll give them to you for $1.50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, you know, just, just really, I guess, your basics that almost everyone else starts off with marbles and spoons and one hitters right on <laughs> now I, I guess it's changed a bit now because uh, i've met a lot of beginners throughout the years and recently they're all like look at my rig well yeah and they're I'm, jumping right into rigs now yeah. doing welds and i'm like holy fuck man yeah i was like we didn't even dream of doing that back then but i mean <laughs> there might be a difference of sellability which was like back when we started i should stop walking uphill i'm just gonna start panting the whole time <laughs> Uh, back when we started you had to make your money back mm -hmm. and so making a rig with subpar welds and blah 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 it, one the time it took you to make it wasn't worth it the material it took you wasn't worth it mm -hmm. and then the chance of success was super low so that wasn't worth it but i feel like nowadays i met a lot of these beginners and i'll look at their rigs and i'll be like oh hey this is you know work and they'll be like, yeah, I just sold that for 50 bucks. Well, so now you have the internet that enables people to be able to sell things that I feel like before head shops wouldn't have bought. I, I, uh, think, you're, I, I think you're right on that, 100%. And it's almost a disservice somewhat to the whole industry because people get something on the internet. Oh, it's cool. And you get it. And it's not yeah. as great as you thought. <laughs> well, there's... Yeah, I, I would say it's a disservice if you're, uh, man, I guess taking really nice photos of a piece, uh, because then you're really truly only selling a picture. Uh, because I've seen so many pieces in person after seeing them online be like, this is nowhere near as vivid and sharp and, you know, elaborate. And, you know, because you can edit all the sharpness of a piece on now and make the colors more vivid. And so I'd say that's definitely the disservice. But I do think it's nice that you're no longer limited by the head shops anymore. Yeah, that is nice, too. It opens up a, a whole new world. Uh, we were so, just talking about uh, how the Internet just pretty much opened it up for people to sell uh, maybe something that a head shop might not might not totally take yet. Yeah, uh, that and just, I guess, anyone in general, really. Like, I, I make my entire living off the Internet. I don't do um, any sort of wholesale nor do I really sell to anyone in person at all. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just, I mean, it's been strictly auctions. Mine is maybe the occasional direct sale to a continuous collector. Okay. Uh, for seven years now, I think. And I, I just like it more. It's uh, It allows me a little more freedom to make something, post it on an auction, and then basically drop it, you know? Like, I'm done at that point. Wherever the bid goes to, I ship it out. They pay and I just get to focus on the next piece. Right. Uh, and, like, it, it's got its ups now. I guess the downs before it would be, like, I'd make a piece, and I'd be like, man, like, based on market values I've seen, this is easily worth 400 And then it'll go up to, like, 180 And I'll just, like, have to kind of bite my pride and be like, you know what, 180 Like, move it and ship it. And, uh, I mean, nowadays, my prices are definitely a lot better. But I just remember back when it was taking half of what I wanted for something just so I could keep my tempo. Right, uh, so right. Down, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a big thing that a lot of glass blowers uh, going through their career and everything like that. They take a lot of hits at the beginning, whether it's learning and shit cracking or just trying to develop who you are. And uh, and that, you know, selling those low cost things uh, where you didn't make much money it did enable your work to get out there and other people to be like, what the fuck is this? Holy shit. So, yeah, no, I, I definitely, uh, I tried to talk to a lot of people about that. Like later in my career, when I see where they were going, and it was like, man, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell this for less than it's worth. And then I see like three cases full of their work. And I'm like, well, at what point are you going to sell it? You know, because it gets to a point where you're sitting on so much product as in like even cost of product that you're now hemorrhaging money. And if you would have just taken 75% off, or sorry, charge 75% of, then you could have had it sold. Someone would be showing it off to their friends 
and you just clear up inventory so you can make more work. But so many people get this idea of like, it's worth this, it's worth this, that you just get caught up in your own head. And uh, it seems really detrimental. Yeah, I think maybe if people look at it as not that they're getting undercut, but that discount is more of a marketing expense, um, yeah. then it doesn't feel like you're getting, you're lowballing. You're, it's a marketing expense. Yeah, well, and then there's also a difference between being someone who's kind of an artist on the side and, like, pours their heart into a piece, you know? Like, here's a here's hundred hours, let's say, painting or even glass on a piece. I can't take less than this, and it's because it means the world to me. That I understand. But whenever you're in a position of like, most of us functional glass artists, which is a, either kind of a production or a heady production or... You know, most people do some form of production. Mm -hmm. All the big names now, like, okay, I'm not going to name them because someone might find this term offensive, but every big name you see has a style, has a template, and they do that template in different colors to sell it. That's called production. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not one of crazy pieces, blah, 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 for the most part. And, and so, I, think, I think that also allows you to really refine your, your, your design because, man, a piece this big, there's there's thousands of things that have to happen to it. And, yeah. and that can take a year to refine and just really, really refine. Oh, true. I think what I was kind of getting at, though, with the whole um, production thing is whether you're a heady or low production, moving your work is the most important thing. And only, if, only moving it allows your name to get out there. Yeah, that. It's just, it's, it's production. It's not your soul, you know, to the most <laughs> right. part. So take what you can get out of it, keep going. And if you keep getting better and selling things, more and more people are going to want it. It's just this like innate supply and demand that keeps picking up the more you sell things. Right. I like that. So, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's my old tangent, I guess, on business. Well, it seems to be working for you. And I, I, I agree with you. So who knows? We could be wrong. Um, did you have a mentor while you were starting? I know you started working with your brother, but did you have, uh, he was only three months ahead of you. Did you have somebody else you really mentored against? And um, So I'd say at the beginning, beginning, uh, besides Matt's studio and them kind of showing him the basics, I think when I showed up, we only stayed for like a couple more months or so. Um, and then in the mom's garage, it was really just um, Glass Line magazine. And there were some Revere videos online back then. And there was one other random blower. I can't remember who it was, but you could find on YouTube. And uh, yeah, it was basically it was that. It was a magazine and YouTube. And then I'd say after... I like that. Nobody's ever given their mentor a magazine and YouTube. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, that's the beauty of today, right? Like all the information's there if you want it in some form of yeah. publication. And then uh, I'd say probably about a year or two in, we started realizing that there was a, a scene around us. You know, uh, there was, you know, Earl Jr. possibly, um, Flex Glass, uh, Neep. And there was just this whole Dallas area scene and Austin scene too that we didn't realize existed. And so we started going to like Seneca, which was actually a hot shop. But they had a back area where they did some lamp working. And uh, just people would go and they're like, oh, Mylon Townsend's in town and he's going to make a dragon. And so we get to meet all these other lamp workers while there. And I'd say that kind of turned into our mentorship after a while, which was, you know, I'd go and I'd be like, hey, I've been working on Reticello disc flips and I can't quite figure out how to terminate it or something, you know, and Glass Diver would be there. And he'd be like, oh, man, because it's too hot. Like, it's a real simple mistake. You just turn down your heat a bit and I'd turn it down and bam, it worked good. And so it was a whole lot of interactions like that that I'd say kind of more became our mentors, which was we'd find people who had been doing techniques longer than us and ask them how to do it, and they'd give us the little troubleshooting, and we could do it better. Uh, so, yeah, I think the Dallas community was a huge part of our upbringing in the industry, um, not only how we sold work, but how we made it, too. Man, that, that's cool. Um, what classes, or if any, have you taken in – if you have taken them, do you recommend classes to others? Um, I've never paid for a class. So you, so you basically get your knowledge by, by being an artist, 
and bumping shoulders with somebody and saying, hey, man, show me how to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I so there's a, I know most of my learning did come from asking things and watching, and there's such a fine line of, like, learning too much of what you watch. I don't feel it as much anymore, but I remember back when, like, I had a few of my things stolen by people. And it was like my color text, how I did something and the specific colors I used in the style. And they'd watch me. And then the next day they'd be like, hey, look, I made this thing. And I'm like, that's my shit. You know, like I'm selling that. Now, if you're selling that, how am I going to sell that? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of like the over of it. But I'd say for the most part these days, I just don't care at all. Um, and yeah, so I'd say that most learning for most people happens from kind of staring over your shoulder, wherever it's around, uh, it can just kind of get into a weird ethical area, wherever you learn that way, as opposed to like paying for a class from or, you know, elbow or whatever, and then you paid them for that knowledge. So anything you do with it, they literally can't say anything about because mm -hmm. you paid them to use it. Right. Uh, so do I suggest classes if you want to avoid all the ethical issues? Yeah. <laughs> um, or ask for some help and then make a tweak to somebody's style and, and say hey yeah. do you mind if I do this and tweak it because I think most people are like bro have fun at it man I, I've, I would say maybe a 50% are like have fun at it the other 50% will say go for it see you do it and it's not different enough for their taste oh that's and a good point I've seen so many feuds in glass over this you know, we're just like, man, the guy said I could try it and I did. And then like, apparently I made too many. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, you know, <laughs> maybe just make your own style then or just don't care and make money. And if you do, then you're the better person to making money. So what? I love your attitude, man. <laughs> uh, have you had periods in your career where you shifted your focus entirely from like, say you were just doing pipes and then you went to pendants or uh it, it feels like now I, I just mostly really see you do a lot of uh you know the bonsai stuff yeah um i mean no i think it's kind of always been a pipe basis which is that at the beginning yeah i'd make some pendants i'd you know do some experimental like a cup or something like that but um after a while i think in this industry you learn that pipes are what sell i mean if you ask me if I wanted to not drop a stem in anything and put a mouthpiece on it ever again, yeah, I'd, I'd rather not, to be honest. Pipes are cool. I love them and whatnot, but I love glass blowing now. Like, yeah. it's, it's the creation of something that I love, and it just so happens that most of my demographic are pipe smokers. <laughs> That's it. And so a lot of people are like, oh, man, you don't even like making pipes. It's like, well, I don't mind it. You know, I do the extra function for the people who are my demographic. But, I'm, yeah, I'm a little burned out on making pipes. I just want to make them, but that's what's there, if that answers your question. So, yeah, I, I don't really change gear and focus because I know where my demographic is. And I know they've supported me all these years. And it'd also be kind of weird to stop making pipes, I guess. Because uh, that's the whole industry that has got me to this point. Uh, I don't yeah. know how else to explain that one. It's almost like a, uh, it's almost like being in the underground punk scene forever, and then all of a sudden, like you get offered a bigger concert in some mainstream stadium. And while I understand taking the more money and everything like that, you know, it's like the people who supported you through all of it aren't really the demographic you'd be playing for anymore. Right. Uh, so sometimes not making pipes just seems like. Uh, even though I don't smoke weed anymore, a lot of people know that about me, uh, would be like betraying the, the people who've always been there. <laughs> no, it makes total sense, man. Yeah. And this, this industry... Not, but it just makes sense to keep doing it for multiple reasons. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this industry really has, you know, being pipes, you know, what was borosilicate glass before? Like, they didn't really do a lot of art with it. And this industry, pipes, really expanded that that boral silicate art industry out there. Yeah, that's a, it's a, probably one of the newer markets. I mean, until all this like digital art came along, but besides digital art, I would say boral silicate pipe art is a, a pretty new niche. That's uh, been kind of going through an evolution, you know, before your eyes where you see 
<laughs> oh man, underground, you sell it to the head shop, you're trying to undercut China, and if you're lucky, you could sell a heady, you know? And they'd be like, all right, we'll take five of your spoons and your $100 heady, blah, blah, blah. Now, though, it's like you saw it go from this underground kind of starving artist thing to quote unquote rock stars, which is super weird. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's neat, though. Yeah, no, it's dope as shit that pipes can go for a hundred grand. You know, I, it's, a, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a whole new world uh, that's opening up. But I do think it's also, um, it opens up to like the elitism that I think everyone kind of talks shit about when we were younger. I mean, like, oh, bougie fucking art. You know, you and your fucking gallery, hoity-toity, go smell your own fart kind of shit. <laughs> and now what's happening is that a lot of people in this industry are having these gallery shows that you got to pay to get in that are super nice, that are, you know, pretentious up to an extent. And uh, that's, that's just kind of interesting, you know, to see that flow over to that. I'm not against it. I think it's great that people are able to do whatever they want in life. If it's making really expensive, you know, pieces and selling them to whatever class of people, et cetera, et cetera, you know, dope, you know, if it makes you happy. I just think it's very, very... I don't know. It's funny, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's just funny is just the way of putting it, just to see how quick it changed, you know, from my perspective, from 11 years ago, when I didn't know anyone selling online. Fuck like, no. you know, there was glasspipes.com or whatever, but I mean, like, a, like what you see on Instagram now, which is just an onslaught of everything, and, you know, I'll watch, like, a gong auction, and, you know, that'll go for, like, two grand easy. Uh, for like a bead and i'm like wow dude like people are getting paid for stuff now that's fucking crazy it, yeah, yeah it's uh and it is good because you know i guess the more you get paid the more the better life you can live the better food you can eat the better education you can give your family uh, true i mean money makes shit happen whether it's your dreams or whatever so yeah it can for sure i don't know if i want to get into I told myself before this call, I was like, you're not going to get into too much philosophy, Ty. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll get out of this. So I'll, I will ramble forever. Well, you know, and, and I, I, I have seen your things on there, and I love it, you know, because uh, it, it's just really good. And I, and I think that, you know, there's things about being political, not too political, but there is things when we do need some confrontation, and we do have got to have discussions, and now's probably not the time, but... I think we always need to keep talking. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, it's there's a time and a place for it all. I've been starting to feel like maybe my uh, my Instagram isn't always the best place for it. <laughs> but you got to get your thoughts out, you know. And uh. yeah, it's it's a it's definitely a gamble. There's because uh, I know a lot of people followed me for a long time because of uh, how outspoken I was, you know, about like the pipe industry and everything, and just how I felt about it. Uh, even if it seemed a little detrimental. Uh, but then as I've gotten more followers, and so like that's like the, the twenty to 30,000 follower area where, you know, I can be a little more niche like that. Then now I've noticed once I've gotten closer to like the 100,000 followers, what I say is far more, um, uh, you know, people are being more critical of it. Because like I, I didn't realize I could do this, but I lost probably 400 followers the other day from just something that I thought was a little tongue in cheek. And like, I, I think I basically attacked both, you know, liberals and conservatives at the same right. time. And I, <laughs> you know, I was just basically like this whole division is a sham and blah, blah, blah. It's a really tongue in cheek way. And I just lost a bunch of followers. And I was like, huh? Well, were those really after? good followers to begin with? Is the next question I pose, you know, like, Wait, ask that again? Sorry, that car was a little loud. Uh, those 400 followers you lost, were they even good people? Were they worth it? You know, were they actually your fans? Or were they just trolls trying to troll? Um, because uh, I feel like, you know, if you say something I disagree with, I want to hear it. I want to. I like confrontation. It, it's what gets me to grow and see something different. Well, I, I do think that that's uh, kind of what's it called synonymous with being an artist, right? I mean, the idea generally is that we're supposed to express so that way someone gets something out of it and we cause them to question or observe something. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> I guess the irony of it is that whenever I post my thought post and oh, 
Oh, did we cut out? Okay. No, we're good. Uh, whenever I post my thought post, inevitably someone's like, just get back to blowing glass. <laughs> <laughs> and in my head, I think about that and I'm like, well, wait, I thought I was an artist. Like, you know, like the social expectation of artistry is create, create and make me think. <laughs> and so as soon as you post something that's thought, a lot of people are like, shut up and go back to making your, you know, objects. And it seems a little counterintuitive to me because I, I don't really know how to respond to those people other than kind of tell them like, you know, this is our job in a way. You know, there's, there's craftsmanship, which is just building something for the sake of it. You know, it's beautiful or whatever. And then there's artistry, which is expressing something that you want the world to hear. And that's and, uh, either supposed to piss them off or make them happy or but some kind of evokes, you know, evokes some kind of emotion. I suppose so. You know, I, I usually just as a, as a, as my own tactic, I like to do neither. I, I prefer when people remain very objective uh, in topics uh, just because I think you get more information done. And that's what a lot of us are missing in things is, you know, I, I could piss you off by talking about certain like people or cultures or whatever. And like, you know, pointing out, flaws of you know this one genre of american uh and that's just all it usually gets is a bunch of hurrah and nays out of it but if you can take the time to really get people to a neutral zone and just give information and talk to them in a palatable way i think you'll get far more done than than uh, you know provoking a riot you know and that's what i notice on a lot of your posts they're really thought provocative like there you're not really taking any sides and like you said you were knocking liberal and uh conservative so that's really neat how you do that uh i enjoy it i, I try to also like i know people don't like this but i, I try and also uh censor mine and uh i know people like oh don't censor free speech but th the point is, is that some people say things that are just rude that are just mean and don't really even pertain to the topic and so all you're going to get after that is a bunch of yelling and Name and call. Yeah, and I'm looking at it like, you know, I'm, I'm okay if you say something aggressive towards the topic, uh, because in my opinion, that's, that's your subjective feeling introduced to it. That's fine to an extent. But as soon as you call the other person, you know, an asshole or something and has nothing to do with the topic, <laughs> it's going to throw the entire conversation off. And then people get on there and they read it. They're like, yeah, flame war. And uh, yeah, so I do police my own topics a lot. I think that helps uh, keep them on track. And I do have definitely people making fake accounts to go comment again. And, you know, man, you're such a pussy for deleting my comment. And I'm like, you're really taking the time to just get another account just to comment that. And uh, I do get a sixth sense of satisfaction when I block that one also. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but something about blocking them. And then that new restrict feature. Man, that adds some spite to it. <laughs> now you can say something really long and mean to someone like who's trolling you and then restrict them so they can still respond, but no one sees it and they don't know that no one sees it. Ah. So then you sit there and they think they're right because you didn't respond, but the truth is no one read it. <laughs> it's a real silent type of spite, but I, I have to say I enjoy it. <laughs> I love your tactics. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a messed up one. Um, anyway. uh, what is the most difficult piece you've ever attempted to make? Hmm. Can I take a while to think about that? Yeah, we could come back to that. Um, what's your favorite color to work with? <laughs> clear, I guess. <laughs> All right. Yeah, clear's the best. I mean, it, it works great. It's really compatible with itself. Uh, you can't over anneal it. You know? Yeah, clear, man. That's the best shit. I fucking love it. So with that said, what color do you not like? Oh, God. Like, it's a much longer list. Um, you know, honestly, dude, I, I hate working with blacks and whites. Um, just anything that's volatile. I just cannot stand it these days. And the reason is, is because my bonsais usually take me about four reheats now. And so the thought, like, shamrock is the only green I won't touch now again because that doesn't like that many reheats. But, like, you can make a piece perfectly with black or white. And then you send it through, like, four or five cycles, it's going to check somewhere. 
Like mm -hmm. I've just always had that issue over cycling uh, colors, especially the more volatile ones tend to check just from being over cycled. Right. That makes sense. Uh, so like I used caramel and um, forest green now. Occasionally I use evergreen if they're out of forest green. And those two are just real solid colors. Uh, caramel, the more you, you know, run it through a cycle, just the darker it gets. Uh, never had any volatility issue. So I'll take like five reheats to finish my bonsai and I'm not worried at all. And then for what I do, how I get my pads done, the, um, the forest green has been surprisingly durable. I was yeah. kind of worried. Because it used to boil really easy and it would have bubbles in it. I always wondered like, man, how the hell does he do that? But you're saying forest green works well for you. Yeah, actually, I, I haven't had issues. I know what you're talking about. Like the first forest green I ever used like 10 years ago, that stuff boiled. I like to think they reformulated it. Um, yeah, I think they did. Have you tried uh, like timber yet? Uh, wait, I always get timber and grizzly messed up for some reason. Yeah, um, so timber is like a really light green. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I used that in the rod form. It was super easy to work. Yeah, I really um, love it. It's a little bright for what I'm doing, though. Yeah, it is bright. Uh, so, yeah, I like the darker greens if possible. But, you know, Shamrock is my favorite of the depth of green. But, again, it's just really volatile. Just not worth it when you go in there. You got all that time into it. And you followed all the steps right. And then the, the chemistry is like, yo, get out of here. Yeah, which I guess at that point, you technically did not follow the steps right. <laughs> Because, because work, you knew. Yeah, working the color is a part of working the steps, right? So some colors, for me, it's just not worth taking the time to learn. And so, I'm not with that, get so with that said, I like it. Uh, so I'm assuming you go by the thing. If that piece broke, it's more than likely your fault, not the glasses' fault. I mean, it's, it's your fault every time, period. Uh, the, the only thing when it's not, quote unquote, your fault is if you don't have the knowledge. But... If, if I know to look for, let's say I buy a crucible pole from fucking North Star or whatever, and I see that there's some bubblation in there that looks like impurities, I need to look out for that because I know that can wreck a piece. Mm -hmm. um, if I need a real smooth section and I buy a you know two pole from, oh, I don't know, whoever does the, the Golden Gate, Golden Gate, and I see like a bunch of bubbles in it and I don't want any bubbles. That's for me to catch up with, you know, like you got to look for that stuff. So whatever and, it is, if you've been so, left long enough, it's kind of your own fault. If you don't learn it first, do a trial piece with a new color. Right. Right. And yeah, even if it's a little pendant, like that's, that's a good thought, man. It's yeah. I mean, COEs, I mean, if, if <laughs> okay. If you have a COE issue on a whole new color put together, that's not your fault. What's your fault is if you try to build a fucking heady with that new color. <laughs> like, that's fucking stupid. Brand new color, and they say, oh, it's fucking transparent neon green sparkly. And you're like, that's gorgeous. And you try to put 12 hours in that piece. Yeah, it's kind of your fucking fault it cracked because you didn't learn how to work that and what it goes with. Right. Should have made a uh, simple little pipe first. and Yeah. Yeah. Do a pipe, do some solid, do a cold lay it on top of another color. See how quick that checks. You know, there's a lot of tiny things you can do to test out the volatility and COE issue of another color. Without you know, losing you, money. Without losing money. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So, and time, more importantly, in my opinion. Mm, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I can lose money if I can get it back in time quick enough. <laughs> But a lot of people sit there, like I said, and they'll, I'll watch them like, oh, dude, I just got this new batch from Troutman. It's so dope. And then I'm going to make one of my fucking $500 rigs out of it. And then it cracks everywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, why did you do that? Like, you know, t t make one of your small pendants. Yeah, uh, I, guess so, yeah. It's, I guess it's the hype or the, you know, believing that they got the colors figured out now. Well, I, I mean, but they'll do new ones. I've seen people do that. So I guess my point is that, yes, it's always your fault when it cracks. Yeah, yeah. But you could be smarter about it. Um, what do you consider the most challenging style or piece that you blow? Um, hmm. I mean, I really only make that wood style right now. I've been like... <laughs> hunkering down on those bonsais hardcore 
but would I say they're the most challenging? I guess, like, technique-wise, it was probably my encased bonsai. Um, that was the, I think they're called Realism Bonsai series. And that one, undoubtedly, was harder uh, technique-wise, because I was doing, like, that ring seal by hand. And uh, I was punting up to the bonsai that I was encasing. And that was definitely, you couldn't wiggle it too much or that punny would snap. And I also used that punny onto the top of the bonsai as a bridge um, for whenever I was doing the ring seal. So as soon as that like got knocked off or fucked up or anything, it would just, you know, it'd get off center and start to get wobbly. And that was like, I don't know, however, long, however big that is. It's a, it's a large ring seal to do by hand on a Red Max. No doubt. That's and, huge. Uh, I would say technique wise, that one. Are you still using a Red Max now? Yeah, yeah, still using a Red Max. Wow, wow, that's cool. Yeah, people say that, man. I still don't think it's that bad of a torch. I think a lot of people see it as a bad torch because it's cheap and it doesn't have the biggest, you know, size flame output. Well, somehow you have definitely figured out how to use it to its max potential. And, you know, I've, I had never used a national torch until about three years ago and realized that's one of the best freaking torches you could get. It's super versatile. Um, so yeah, I think it's all about knowing your tools and you obviously know your tools. Yeah. Knowing your tools and just working within your, um, I don't know, within your parameters too is really important. I say like, that all the time to my crew, man, let's just work together in our parameters. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, a lot of times you want, um, your wants don't align with your capabilities. And if you keep like trying to force it, you're just going to hurt yourself. Uh, that's the best way I can put it. Um, I, I have a red max. There's certain sizes I just can't do. And so rather than learning, you know, how do I make this go bigger? How could I mod my torch? How could it blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm content with my torch. I like the way it works. So because I never wanted to learn a new torch and take that long time to not make money, I was just like, let me just get more intricate. So I adapted my surroundings rather than, you know, kept trying to force it. Uh, uh, I, think that's the, I think that's almost the, the true definition of human ingenuity is you, you use what's around you and, and make the best of it. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, there, that. You put it much better than I did. <laughs> Well, because I was able to build off your foundation. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's the most amount of time that you've ever spent into a single piece? Does that include repairs? <laughs> um, I guess if you had to come back and fix it, because, yeah, that can be yeah, completed. That, that completed. Can be a bigger piece, usually. Um, man, most time I've spent on one piece. I mean, I know it was like three full work days, which I know doesn't sound like that's that a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. For a glass artist, though, that's always the weird thing is uh, I'm going to side note into this really quick. I hate in our industry how everyone always asks, like, how long did that take you as a means to value your work? Right. Um, it's, it's kind of like, you know, why didn't you ask, you know, your musician how long it took them to write that song or, you know, stuff like that. How, you ask the painter how long it took them to figure out that color mix. You know, it's, it's like so irrelevant how long something took you. It's and your entire I, career, really, I feel. Yeah. I mean, even away from that answer, it's just the logistics of it feels weird that people want to, like, gauge how much an hour you made off of something mm. when you're like, man, this isn't really hourly work. This, this took a lot of different things. This took three years for me to stumble upon this technique, trying to figure it out until I finally figured it out. You know, a, so, man. Like it's not the logistics of it aren't that I spent five minutes on the section. The logistics of it are I spent three years refining and figuring out to get to this five minute moment. You're paying me for this performance. You're not paying me for my time. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that's why I always get kind of weird when people are like, how long did it take you? And I'm like, well, glass actually people aren't usually doing like like a painter a painter would be like, Oh man, I'm four months into building this, you know? And they put like a couple hours a day. 
Well, you can't really do that in glass because you keep reheating something. Like I talked about earlier, it's going to crack. So it's all about these kind of long, uh, strenuous stints. And then you put it together. So anyway, I'd like to say 18 to 20 hours is my most. That, and, and that's a crazy amount of time, you know. And, and like you said, it was all the time to figure out how to make those parts and how to put it together so the fucking piece don't break on you. Um, yeah, it only took an hour to make or 20 hours to make. There were broken pieces that went into it. And I love how you put that. It's not time just now. It's, it's the whole experience that you put into it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, all art is a performance. And uh, I think that's kind of the what we're paying someone for is that they can perform in a certain way that just other people can't or in a way that entices feeling out of us. Uh, there's there's a reason why you pay like two bucks for a McDonald's hamburger. It's because it's a preset. Um, man, I'm out of words. It's a preset recipe. And so what you get is the same thing more or less consistently. There's no thought. There's no evolution behind it. Uh, but then the reason you're paying $15 for this nice burger is because that chef there has spent time and alterations. And he's probably two years ago, that burger's not the same as it is now, even if it didn't change on the menu, because he's a chef and he knows that a little more of this spice tastes good and a little less of this tastes good. Constant. That burger keeps getting constantly refined to perfection. Yeah. And while somebody might, you know, you have two pieces there and this is $20 and this is $200. The 200, when you really get down to it, the details, the, the cleanliness, yeah, there's just so much more there. I think that's what a lot of people mean when they're like, I'm selling a piece of myself. I, I don't see it as this like spiritual, metaphysical piece of themselves, but like I literally took hours of my life to refine this, to refine this, to refine this. And uh, that, that to me is, um, I guess, where I see my beauty in art. Is, the uh, refinement. My yeah, the, the refinement, absolutely. My lady likes modern art. Uh, and I mean the, you know, kind of giant three squares that reach a different color and splatter paint and stuff, you know. And, you know, don't get on to me, whoever sees this fucking interview. But I'm not a huge fan of that type of art a lot. And the reason is, is because while she says there's sentimental value to it, look at the story behind it. I don't see the craftsmanship in there that you wanted to take the time to express something as finally as you could mm -hmm. uh, that's why i like a lot of old old art uh because they spent what little lifetimes they had back then refining this art form and pouring like they were a painter period every technique every outlet every everything they could figure out got put into that art piece mm -hmm. and so that's what i find beauty is that you're willing to actually pour your life into what it is you're doing uh, rather like than that tantrum of expression which again i see the value you know I, I absolutely understand my lady's point when she's like well there's sentiment behind it and emotion is beautiful you know it's very human mm -hmm. that's just not what i find as beautiful in art uh so again it's a real weird discussion i don't even know why i'm getting in the discussion of value of art because i told you i wouldn't get too deep into things but uh, this is yeah. who you are and i think this is what this really not, you know, the first thing was your art that attracted to me through your Instagram, but it is more so like what you post and just your thoughts. And, you know, this this whole conversation here is you, you just didn't just answer some shit out like we, it's you're, you're fucking real, man. And I think that's uh, I, I think that's what makes you the artist that you are. And you see the the that what you consider good art as well as me. That it takes all this craftsmanship. It takes the emotion. It takes, it takes dedication. Well, hold on. I will say I don't think that's what makes good art in general. You know, but yes, yeah, subjectively to me, that's what I like more in art. Right, right. But I will tell anyone that that piece of art is objectively bad. You know, I think when we get into that area is when it gets a little too judgy. You know, I'll look at a piece. I'll say it's bad, but I'll know it's bad in my eyes. It's because like, it's I an opinion. It. Yeah, I hate olives. So if you make a dish that centers around olives, I could take a bite of it and be like, I could see where someone who likes olives would like this. You know, I could be objective about it. Cause like the flavors all work well, but I'll be like, this is a shit fucking dish only because I absolutely despise olives. Right. So I think it's the same with art. It's like, there's certain things I look for that I like, but 
I can never say a piece truly, truly sucks because right. there's someone out there who can like it. So yeah, I think we're a little critical on art as it is. Um, but at the same time, I'm not going to fall down from craftsmanship's important to me. Right. So it's kind of a weird juxtaposition there. And as an artist, you, you put yourself in that eye to, to be criticized for that stuff and to say, hey, I don't like this or I do like your work. Or Yeah, I mean, because like, uh, I think we've all been in positions and I'm sure people looking at my work look at it and they're like they're paying how much for what and we've all done that at some point and uh it's a really weird one to kind of break out of for me because for a long time i talked about practical pricing and art and it was this concept that everything took a certain amount of labor and time and i, I guess it was kind of socialist in retrospect but you know we should all just make back what we can put in and what time it took and find a way to get it as equal as possible that, you know, that guy who's giving me eggs and bread, I'm putting out glass that gets me a sustainable life just like them. Mm -hmm. But then as I further got into it, I'm looking at it. I'm just like, I don't even know anymore. You know, <laughs> like that's not how the world works, I guess. So feeling bad about selling a piece for a certain amount or judging someone else for how much they sold theirs for uh, just starts to become really irrelevant because you realize just how subjective value is at the end of the day. And, you know, I guess there's nothing practical in capitalism. We just take what we can get and do our best with what it is someone gives us. Yeah, yeah. I think that's almost like the world. You just kind of, you know, if you were living in the, the wild and the jungle, you just have to take what it gets and use it and make the best of what it is, I guess. Um, do you I'm, I'm trying to beeline it to my car because I got like, 10% left a couple of minutes ago. So well, if I'm a little distracted, that's why. That's all right. Um, and then, uh, have you ever competed in any events? Uh, no. Okay. I don't think I have. All right. Um, do, you, do you think that's just because uh, you've already got a great market or... Um, you don't like the competition style too much, or you just haven't had the opportunity? Uh, I mean, I'm sure that's a different answer for each period of my life. Okay. Uh, currently, man, someone offered me in a competition. Uh, I think currently I would just not feel like I really have time to do it. Um, yeah. It's just like if I'm blowing glass, I might as well be doing my work. Uh, so that way, you love. Um, not only that, but I have a family and I have a house and I have all these other responsibilities. And so before I had my family, I definitely was far more like go travel, throw it to the wind, you know, no responsibilities right now. See what happens. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, I could take three days off to go to a competition. I should probably spend that three days fixing my house or spending time with my family. Um, so I just don't really have the time within my priorities to do that now. Hell yeah. Um, back then, I'd say I did want to compete a bit probably a few years ago just because I felt like, like, oh, man, my work's becoming cool. It's becoming mine. Like, I think people recognize it, and uh, I think I'm refining it, you know? So I, I wanted to, you know, I guess I had the confidence more than anything a few years ago. Now, looking back, you know, I'm way better than I, I am now than I was then. <laughs> what can we look forward to you in the future? Uh, hold on. I, I can kind of hear you, but you're playing through my, like, my phone. <laughs> instead of the there we go. Hello? Yeah, I can hear okay. you. Okay, we're back. Um, what can we look forward to you from in the future? Uh, more bonsai more bonsai yeah i don't know like literally my whole goal for the past like year has just been refining these bonsai like that's it i i don't really want to do anything else i want to keep getting more and more intricate like i want to practice doing like um shari i believe it's called or shiri it's where you got like the dead bark on the trunk Mm. Um, there's, yeah, I noticed there's, you have some teacups like that 
or your uh, teapots, it looks like. Um, teapots. Oh, that yeah. one's... Uh, I don't think I did one with anything like that, to be honest. Uh, I, I might have. But the idea I would basically do is it would be taking, like, a, maybe, like, Egyptian white or some slightly off-white and, and doing, like, an acalmo on there and carving it up to look more like dead wood growing off the bonsai, uh, where otherwise it would be, like, brown or beige um, on the rest of it. And so that's basically, like, an actual dead part of the tree that they duplicate in bonsai a lot. Um, so things like that. It's just really exploring more things like hopefully one day i'll put like vines growing up one you know and leaves off the vines and, uh th that's the only thing i think that could be looked forward to is just an expansion and made more realistic intricate you know etc cetera, etc cetera, of a bonsai how did you get into the bonsais how did you stumble across that and and, and make that you uh, um i had an idea that's kind of funny i still remember it exactly I just had an idea to do like a like a swirl upward, like it was going to go from like a beaker base and then a just a, a hollow swirl. And my idea was to put like a ball in the middle of that swirl and it was going to look dope as shit. And uh, I basically did the swirl and went like, that's not enough glass. That looks like shit. Like that's, hold on. Um, like this, this looks like nothing that I want to do. So I was like staring at it for a full day. Like, what the hell do I do with this? What I'd used was a um, red exotic and I did a coil and rake, um, like coiled it down clear side by side, raked it down. And I was like, this looks like perfect as some psychedelic shit. Well, by the end of the day, I thought it looked more like a trunk. <laughs> and, uh, I tried building a treetop for it out of some green and the green checked everywhere and it looked like shit. So the next day I picked it up again and more or less, I put like two pads on it. And then I believe I put, at the time, his name was T Mike in glass. He owned a shop in Oklahoma called Up and Smoke. And he let me live in the back of the shop and work in the front as basically like, hey, you're a demo artist. I'll let you work and stay here for free. So that was a pretty cool gig. Anyway, he gave me a flower and I stuck that on there. And that was the first one. It was like literally a mistake. Uh, I posted online and people seemed to like, really like it ish so i was like all right let me let me refine this you know a bit and i started to notice that like people paid for it i was like oh this is dope as shit like you know people are actually paying this consistently because that's the other hard part is you can come up with something new uh sell it for let's just say baseline 300 and then the next one you try and sell goes for 250 and the next one's 225 so really all you showed like through my auction is that there's a really niche demographic for that and so that was most of my work. I'd make something, it'd go for like 300 I'd be like, fuck yeah, I found the cool new thing. Everyone's going to want this. And within two auctions, it was like 180 And I'm like, well, now I'm doing an injustice to the first guy who won the auction because he paid a lot. I feel bad for that guy. So now it keeps going down. I'm not going to keep devaluing his work that he paid you know, for me for. I'm going to stop. And then I'd go find something new. And so I found with the bonsai, it was really nice because I did it and people paid more. And they paid more, and they pay. I was like, "Holy shit!" As I'm refining this, people are paying me more, not less. This is a great new direction. I like this. So, just and, the uh, environment kind of created the whole thing for you, from yeah, one yeah. idea of a spiral ball, and it turned and yeah, pretty much. And I, I think something to bring up right here that's kind of a um, you know unpopular opinion is a lot of people talk about how much capitalism holds them back as an artist. They're like, you know, oh, man, if only I didn't have to wear blah, 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 blah. Well, you really have to look that necessity drives us. And whenever you have something that is like the market that says, like, we want what you have to make, but we want what we want also. And then you find that perfect balance is one of the best drives you can have, in my opinion, which is like, I need to feed my family, myself and my like artistic craving. <laughs> so how do I do that at the same time? And it gets you creative because you'll try something and you'll say, they loved that, but I hated it. How do I tweak it? And then you tweak it and they hated it, but you loved it. So how do I tweak it again? And you start finding that middle ground. Of what do they love? What do I love? And it almost creates more of a universal, like homogenous relationship. That's really nice. Uh, so I would say that capitalism, if used correctly, is really beneficial to the creative mind. 
uh, because it, it pushes one to learn new things, to cope and adapt with the current status of the market. Uh, so that's my two cents there. Yeah. Of like what built my bonsai is also that. That's really cool. You know, I was really expecting some, like you had some kind of uh, Asian culture behind you or something. Because you also <laughs> make the, you also make the, the tea sets, right? Yeah, uh, well, I, I did that for a small stint. The reason I did those mm. is I've been, I've been thinking of those for probably uh, three or four years. You know, just always had it in the back of my head. So like, that would be so fun to make. It had nothing to do with Japanese culture. It's just like, I don't know what it was. I always wanted to do one. And I never fully had it conceptualized. And I think what happened is I hit this long stint of doing my bonsais. And I got worried that people were going to get tired of them. So I kind of took like a commercial break. You know, like, okay, like, I'm on number, like, 12 or 15 of these bonsai in a row. Let me let me do this new thing. And I guess I was so confident from, like, doing these bonsais over and over and, like, refining them that everything else seemed really easy to do. And I don't know why that is. It seems sticking to one thing makes me better at all of glass rather than trying to be a jack of everything makes me not any better for some reason. It's just that, I guess, confidence that comes with refining that uh, helps me a lot. You know, I love what you just said there because I try to, to push that a lot to, to blowers is just keep on one piece, refine and refine and refine it. It sounds boring, but each little spot, if you're truly into it, you will just keep refining it, making it better. And each time that's a tool that you're putting into your pocket. And then when you go try something else, it's not as hard as you thought it was. But if you keep doing this, you never learn those little refinements that you can never use over there. That's it's true. It's like how you were saying earlier, like um, the, this this big piece here is actually like a million steps. Well, when you're doing, let's say, like a, I don't know, a 20 step pipe that each time you do it, whenever something becomes second nature, you then have new focus to apply to elsewhere. And Absolutely. so having that extra focus, you're now refining something else that before you didn't even realize existed. And so you might be doing a Sherlock pull. And you're going, yeah, fuck yeah, this motion, this motion, this. And you get the motion down, right? But then you're realizing that your neck's a little thinner than you want. And you never had time to even notice that during the process before. And you go, oh, if I actually heat it up for another 20 seconds, then I can do this. So now you have the motion down, but now you're focusing on the heat input. And so it's not so much like by refining something, you're just better at glass. By refining something, you're getting something down so you have new focus to put into another area. And you're learning something you didn't even know you didn't know. And that happens a lot. I can't tell you how many times I've done a series up to number like 20. And I'll be like, fuck yeah. And I'll put it down for a week. And I'll come back to do number 21. And it'll fail. Fail over and over. I'm like, why the fuck is it failing? And then I'll pay attention to it. And I'll go, oh, I never realized I did that before. Like I never realized I did elbows up or elbows down right here. Or I prepped that hole in that way. Like I did instinctually from the first one because I accidentally did it. And then, you know, after I quit doing it, the muscle memory has gone. Now I have to actually pay attention to what I was doing. Right. Uh, yeah, There's a lot of times that we do things ourselves that we don't even know that we're doing. And so through refining and doing it over and over, you get more time to notice what you yourself are doing, but you didn't know you were. Um, so, yeah, that's another, I guess, part of like kind of the learning process. Right. Man, beautiful. How did you get into that? What's that? <laughs> I said, how did we get into that? I, it, it was needed. I don't know, but it was needed. Um, are there any shout outs you'd like to give to anybody? Uh, like, I don't know. What's the point of a shout out? Help Somebody who supported you, I guess. Your old lady, maybe. I mean, like, yeah, the whole glass industry, my lady, my mom, my brother. My dad, you know, everyone I've ever met has supported this journey. You know, I'd hate to call anyone out in particular because then right. it like doesn't give credit to the others. No, I don't I, know. Shout out, it would be like someone I don't feel is getting enough sales and like go check them out. <laughs> Maybe it's part the better. You know, like I shamelessly advertise for them is what I'd use a shout out for. Dude, I, I love your attitude, man. <laughs> uh, I really want to say thank you so much for your time today. Dude, man, this was, it, it was a pure honor. I've been, you know, looking over your shoulder, seeing your stuff through the back doors of Instagram and shit. And this was yeah. just, I, when my, my buddy Sam told me that we had you down for interview, I was like, no fucking way. So thanks a lot for making That's my true. day. 
<laughs> well, hey, thank you. This is probably the first interview I've done in like a couple of years. It's, it's interesting. I didn't realize how much I ramble and get off topic until uh, we did this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on that. No, I don't. I think it was perfect, man. So I don't think you rambled. I think it was it was perfect. So. All right. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed. Uh, I'm going to run home now and go be a dad and do work and shit. All right, man. Peace out. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good one, man. You too. Wow. Was that just, they just keep getting better. Like, it's so crazy. I'm having so much fun. Uh, Bubbles was amazing. His points of view, uh, it, it, there's, it, 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 it's just awesome. Like, there's, there's a reason why he is just amazing and his art is amazing because he is amazing. Um, that was so much fun. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. I want to throw this out there real quickly. We got a really cool thing where we need help. Uh, and we got this uh, brand ambassador program called Elevate Dolls. It's super awesome. You get to earn some credits. More importantly, you get to help us uh, build Elevate. And uh, we really appreciate it. I know I appreciate it. Everybody here working does as well. We also got this real cool thing if you want to throw some money our way. Uh, it's a 501c3. You can even write it off on your taxes. Uh, the money goes to help get veterans some vapes, helps get them some other stuff, and we also give them some uh, glass blowing classes. It's really cool uh, just to, to, to watch the, the experience happen, and uh, it's neat. Anyways, elevate mind, body, spirit. Have a great day.